Hey everybody, Steve here. Uh, today I've been dropped off on a piece of water that I've never been to before and I'm using a Euro rig. Now it's a small piece of water and I'm going to kind of walk through how I would approach uh, this kind of tight quarters situation. Um, a Euro rig is a really effective method for this because with a high gradient small stream like this, there's many plunge pools and many complex currents that you need to account for when making a good drift. So we're gonna walk through those different approaches, presentations, rig changes, and everything of the sort here today on the water. So as I'm working my way through this first pool here, I'm kind of gritting the water off and working through the water kind of vertically. Um, what I mean by that is I'm gonna cover the lanes closest to me first and kind of work my way from near to far, you know, bottom to top until I've kind of covered this segment uh, of water thoroughly. And then I'll kind of move on to the next piece maybe take two steps upstream or two steps more across the stream uh, until I've effectively covered basically everything that I can make a good drift in from where my feet are planted now before moving on. So I have kind of a, a glare on the opposite side of me that makes it really hard to see this thin leader. Something that helps with that is getting kind of low. I can see my leader against the backdrop a little bit nicer. Try this tail out a little bit before I move. That's a free stick removal service. A little bit of river landscaping. All right. Gonna make a little change here. Feel like I'm in a spot where I know I should be getting some love and I'm not. So I'm gonna try to uh, fish a little bit deeper. I'm gonna do that in two, two ways. So I'm gonna take, um, of my two fly setup, I'm gonna make my bottom fly the heavier fly, which is gonna have me fishing a little bit more vertically. Um, and I'm going to make that a heavier bug also. So kind of twofold. I'm going to get a little bit more vertical and a little bit more deeper at the same time and just fish kind of a, a heavier bug down low. Now I've seen a little bit of uh, rising action but not too too much here nothing to convince me to put on a dry fly just yet I think later on in the day we might have some some better opportunities at that so without some obvious bug action I'm gonna go with the stone fly which is just a good um, you know prospecting fly in general they're kind of always around uh, for fish to eat so it's a good chance to, to fish something for an opportunistic feeder just kind of trying things out and prospecting here a little bit So 
stone fly is going on the bottom. I'm going to keep the current fly on top until I have reason to think that I shouldn't. I've noticed that there's an occasional gusty breeze and whatnot. Uh, so there's a couple things I'm gonna do to account for that. Uh, first and foremost, I'm gonna go a little bit heavier and that is gonna allow my rig to just get a little bit more taut throughout the drift, help kind of keep things in line. And uh, I'm also going to, you'll notice in my drift, kind of trim up a lot of the line, keep a really low rod angle to keep from getting pushed off course um, and just keep everything kind of lower and tighter altogether. And that should help me kind of compensate for getting pushed around by uh, the old W. So first thing there I mentioned is a fly change. So I'm gonna do that now. Just going from like a 2.8 millimeter bead to kind of a, a 3.8 millimeter bead. Uh, when I want my flies to enter the water with a little bit of slack, what I'm trying to do there is let them get deeper, faster, and then come into contact with them and begin my drift. Let the flies tell you when they're ready to start moving downstream. And to do that, I'm gonna make what's called a tuck cast. So just a quick demonstration of that a few times, kind of demo it on this kind of slower water over here. When I finish my casting stroke, I'm gonna raise and extend my arm so that I kind of stop that short and it'll, my flies are gonna kick over and drop down to the water first with a little bit of slack on the tippet. So we just raise and extend like that. And then I'm gonna come in contact with them and begin my drift. You'll see that again here. I'm gonna come around, go, stop and raise the rod tip. The flies enter. And then I get into contact with them and allow them to begin the drift in their own time, knowing that they're down in that strike zone, that kind of buffer of slower current towards the bottom. So you want to stick that landing, get into contact with them, and then begin making that drift so that no matter when or where a fish eats, you're going to be able to feel that and set the hook. So we haven't picked up any fish on nymphs yet. We've seen a couple fish coming up to the top. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a dry dropper here on the Euro rig. So I'm going to go with a really light uh, dropper on there because I'm going to use a pretty small dry fly, but there is going to be a little bit of weight and tungsten to it because I need it to kind of help turn over that rig and, and kick it out from the rod. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna go with a small dropper on there and I'm gonna add a little bit of loon pay it paste uh, float into that cider material to help, you know, get a good kind of dry fly drift with this uh, micro thin Euronymphing leader that I'm using. Um, so I'm standing here at the tail out, gonna try to make some upstream presentations at fish get a good drift and see if I can't get one to sip uh, a little itty bitty dry fly here or pick up on that dropper. So as you can see, uh, a Euronymphing micro leader, uh, it's not the best casting leader in the world, but you can grease it with a little uh, floating on that cider, make a cast that's kind of driven by the weight of that small tungsten dropper and get a good drift with, you know, I have a size 20 parachute atoms on here and uh, a nice little wild brown trout on the end of it.
<laughs> All right, so in this first pool here, I've tried a lot of different things. I've gone really heavy, I've gone light, I've gone flashy, natural, big, small, different beads, uh, just different flies in general. I've made you know one lap and back and back again of getting different drift angles and approaches to get better presentations for different uh, rigs that I had. And um, I just had to read what the fish were telling me. I wasn't picking any up subsurface, uh, but I was seeing some really small stuff um, up on the surface emerging, some fish coming up for you know dry flies. And normally, I would just keep the rig that I have on on and go to the next pool. That's the easy thing to do. That's the, the cop out here is just say, I have nymphs on, they're heavy. I wanna fish subsurface. I know it's gonna work at some point. I'm gonna find a pool where fish are gonna to wanna to crush some nymphs underneath the surface there. And I could just hit all the A water and cherry pick my way up. But in the interest of talking about what separates a really good angler from a really, really good angler is somebody who's willing to make the change. If you read what the fish are telling you and take that into consideration, you're gonna catch more fish if you're willing to make that change. In my case, that was, hey, I'm gonna put on a size 20 Griffith snat and a really small midge emerger underneath that, and I'm gonna put some floating on my cider, and I'm gonna make some funky casts because I have a micro thin urine nymphing leader on here. But if I'm willing to do that, even though it's inconvenient, I'm gonna open up more doors to catch more fish in this pool because that's the info that I'm receiving. You gotta take that into account if you wanna catch more fish. Of course, you could cherry pick, keep that same rig on, but when you're reading small water like this, it's good to be willing to make the change. So I was gonna leave this pool, but I'm always enticed by the fish that I can see, the whole, you know, don't leave fish to find fish. So I'm kind of pushing it, uh, pushing in a little bit more than I would have if I had just came here. I'm just trying to see what I can see, you know, try some different drift angles and things like that. Um, but from this vantage point, I'm now able to see something that I haven't seen all morning. And that's where the fish are facing on this little flat right here. So as you can see, there's kind of a main seam coming down off of my front left. Uh, and then another one off of my right here. And then there's this higher kind of shallower uh, bench of really fine gravel. And now that I can see what the fish are doing in here, it kind of makes sense that I wasn't able to get a lot of fish to eat the nymphs. There are so many complex currents coming between, you know, the eddy off of this rock. There's a real big pillow of, of uh, dead water there kind of flowing back upstream, kind of away from me. And then I have the seams coming down either side. And now that I can see these fish in an area like this where there's a lot of complex currents and then a cushion of dead water on top of this high spot and behind that rock, they really can be facing anywhere. Generally speaking, when they're feeding, fish are gonna face into the current. Uh, that's where they're gonna get that conve conveyor belt of food. Um, but without knowing what's going on in the bottom, you don't know what into the current really means. Looking at the surface, you would say it moves upstream to downstream, obviously. Uh, but a lot of these fish are facing um, away from me, going like this. Some fish are facing directly upstream. Uh, some fish are facing off to my right shoulder. Some of them are cruising and eating uh, bugs that are kind of tumbling through this weird little uh, complex current zone. Um, so if you get the chance to do this, kind of get in there and look and see what's going on before you move on to the next pool, it's an interesting way to check out a spot that you know you might not fish regularly, but now you can come back to and see, hey, I know the last time I was here, that spot right there has a lot of fish on it facing a lot of different ways. How can I use that information to get you know, teed up for the best presentation for that spot? Is it uh, from the left bank, the right bank, directly downstream, directly upstream? And it's just a good way to understand better uh, the way that fish will hold in different kinds of currents based on the substrate and the structure around it. So one last note about that complex eddy going on. That kind of horseshoe shape that you see, um, those edges, those seams, that transition zone where you can see two very obviously different speeds of current and actually directions of current. If I were to try to make a subsurface presentation there, I would first start out with uh, a nymph rig. The best thing about this Euro rig is I can actually get a drift that goes upstream and follows that eddy back up towards uh, the bend of that horseshoe up against this rock up here. Um, I've done that before and it's a great way to fish nymphs where you wouldn't be able to with an indicator because the surface would want to pull downstream while uh, up against the substrate would want to pull you back upstream. So from a side kind of quartering upstream presentation, you could feed those nymphs up into that eddy and do it that way. And another thing you can try with a lot of complex currents like that is jig a small streamer through there. Um, 
a jig bugger is a great one to do it, but there's pretty much endless options to do that. Um, but that's just going to give you a presentation where it doesn't have to be a dead drift and you can show them something that they might be accustomed to seeing um, coming up over that gravelly shelf right there and you might get some eats that way as well. You heard me mention earlier in the video, you know, don't leave fish to find fish. Now we've caught more than I could, uh, you know, hope for in this uh, small area right here, moving around back and forth with dry flies, changing the rigs up and just, you know, seeing what won't they eat. Uh, we've certainly found out what they will eat. But in the interest to show reading different types of pools, different runs uh, and things like that, we're gonna keep moving on and show you guys how to approach, break down and make effective drifts uh, in different types of water, different plunge pools and currents and seams and stuff like that. So follow me and we're gonna go hit some new stuff. Well, folks, I know you just heard me say that I was gonna move on, but I may have lied. I know fishermen never lie about, you know, making one last cast. But yet, here I am. There he is. <laughs> I know what I said, okay? I know what I said. But, uh, you know, I just can't help myself. It's a disease. Small wild trout on dries. Pretty fun way to uh, mess around with the many different things you can do with a Euro setup. So. We'll show you some other techniques, and this time I really mean it. We're going to move on after one. Well, I'm just kidding. We're going to move on. <laughs> All right, so we fished quite a bit of dry dropper, and now I've approached a spot that has some faster current. Uh, the sun's a little bit higher. Uh, the fish aren't rising as regularly, and with the stiffer water and complex currents, I'm actually going to switch back to a true uh, tandem nymph rig. Typical on the Euro nymph setup, I have a dropper. I have a point fly. I'm fishing them a little bit closer together than I usually would. Um, I've got them probably about a foot apart. What that does is helps with both my sink rate and also my ability to maintain a dead drift amongst all these complex currents. Um, so I'm gonna give this a go and kind of continue working my way through some of these deeper, faster, more pockety runs um, with a true double nymph rig. So let's give that a shot and uh, see how we make out compared to the dry dropper setup. There was an eat, missed him. Things happen quick. Again, I'm trying to work near to far, low to high, so I effectively cover the water, catching any fish down low before I go up high. So if they make a big ruckus, I'm not spooking any potential uh, future candidates. Casting a little bit um, further than that main current line into the softer water on that far bank, as you'll see. Um, that allows the flies to get to depth and then get nudged into the current and kind of, again, tell me when they're ready to start making the drift. High rod angle. Keeping my arm extended, my wrist kind of up on a 45. 
when the winds do kind of gust more, just like now, I'm gonna strip in, keep everything kind of low. Try to new current seam. All right, and before I reach totally across, I'm gonna try this real shallow riffle, see if we can't pull anything out right here. This is when having a heavier fly on that dropper rather than the point is gonna help you effectively fish shallower stuff a little bit more horizontally um, and not hang up as bad. Kind of leading stuff along the bottom that way. Getting a little gusty, but I'm gonna try to keep fighting it here. Before I punch up further upstream, I'm gonna work without moving my feet and keep trying this same kind of window of drifts that I can make. Again, just trying to go from near to far, low to high. Don't be afraid to get real tight to structure and paint the bottom underneath rocks and stuff like that with your nymphs. A lot of times when you catch a fish on a drift like that, they'll actually be darker because um, their skin will kind of try to camo them as best it can to their environment. So when you pull, say, a brook trout out of a log or a trout out of an undercut bank or something like that, you can actually sometimes notice the difference in how they are camouflaged for that particular spot they're laying in. Part of the fun of these small streams is figuring out how to land the fish after you've hooked them. Lots of currents and structure to deal with. And that's a pretty decent fish for a piece of water this size. So getting directly downstream of them, using the current to your advantage. You can kind of cut them off as they come downstream, just block them with the net. So uh, like I was saying, putting your nymphs a little bit closer together um, is gonna help you fight some of these complex currents. As you can see, there's quite a lot going on here. Uh, kind of cast my flies up onto that shelf, uh, let them get to depth in this trough right in front of me on the pillow of this uh, rock here. Um, this big kind of barrier has a lot of soft water in that corner pocket. So I'm keeping my rod tip high and forward, letting it get a little bit more vertical and then once they catch uh, the current, I'm going to begin that drift, and that's right where you ate. So um, I'm using 6X, which is also helping fight those complex currents. Um, instead of getting pushed around by it, it kind of holds its own and tracks through the river better as the current rushes by. And uh, yeah, now I'm back up in the saddle here, and we're going to try to get ourselves another one. So here we go. Now I'm going to try to reach for that soft water on the far side and see if anyone's hanging out in that slow eddy. So high rod angle, maybe let it flirt with the edge of that current first. We'll try and close. There, oh, there he was. The game was afoot. 
see if we can't get anybody else to be a willing participant. And a little further. So like I was mentioning earlier, currents move in a lot of weird ways, and uh, you can even uh, allow your flies to drift upstream in an eddy like the one uh, you just saw me fishing in. So uh, don't be afraid to let that happen if you uh, want to get a drift in a weird spot like that. That fish already came off that barbless hook, so works for me. Right back to fishing. All right, new spot, new piece of water. Still rocking the double nymph rig. Heavier on top, a little bit lighter on bottom. Fishing them close together, fighting those complex currents, all that good stuff. Um, here we have a spot that's something that I think a lot of people would just walk right past. Uh, it doesn't look like anything at all. Like I, you know, wouldn't go above my knee really um, in some of this water over here. And I'm gonna give it a shot. Uh, it's shallower than, you know, what most people think looks very fishy. Uh, but spots like this that have a little bit of glide to it, some good structure, cover, shade, lots of current bringing food down. Uh, it's a great spot for fish to hold and feed in small rivers like this. And um, I think it's just kind of overlooked. If you want to, you know, get better at catching more fish in more types of water, don't just cherry pick and go from A water to A water to A water, hitting only the deep spots all the time. Try some of this stuff out. Hit the B water, hit the C water. You know, glides and riffles like this have tons of food, structure, cover, everything that a trout wants, um, and it's worth at least giving it a shot. So I'm gonna work up through this section of all this shallow stuff and see if we can't find a fish or two. Oh, I didn't have a good exit strategy for this guy. But luckily, he's small. And even with 6x, I can kind of steer them around. Come on now. <laughs> All right, nothing wrong with that. Small, wild rainbow. Another technique that we haven't talked about yet is jigging a streamer on a Euro rig. I have that same micro thin Euro leader on there. Um, here we have kind of a deep, fast plunge pool. Uh, small light flies aren't gonna cut it, uh, trying to get down and dirty. So I have a nice, heavy, um, old favorite, the black woolly bugger here. Just a jigged bugger, um, heavy tungsten bead on there. And let's see if we can't uh, tease out a fish from this spot. You can give it a dead drift, twitch it, jig it up and down, let it swing a little bit, come directly downstream with it. Um, you know, if it's heavy enough, I've kind of talked about how you can cross lead by casting um, across the stream, it's going to want to draw back underneath your rod tip just with that additional weight. So you can kind of get a nice cross stream presentation, which works well because, you know, a small bait fish isn't, you know, always going to flee from a bigger fish by running upstream, up into the current. They're going to go wherever they can haul ass, which is with the current. So it makes sense to pull streamers uh, downstream like this.
not the biggest fish in the world, but he did eat a streamer. There you go, folks. Euro streamer, getting jiggy with it. Na 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 na. Will Smith, man, why'd you stop making music? Whoop. Okay, so we've covered a variety of topics and a variety of water today, all with a 10 and a half foot three weight Euro nymphing rod. Now, uh, this setup, this micro thin Euro leader, this Euro nymphing setup all together is definitely not the end all be all of fly fishing. However, it's extremely versatile for all sorts of water. We've done dry dropper, we've done double nymph rigs, we've done jiggy streamer, and you know we've talked about presentation, drift angle, approach, uh, changing when you know you need to change, listening to what the fish in the river are telling you, reading those signs, and just being willing to adapt to what you see going on. If you're willing to do that, if you're willing to dial it in, not just on small water, that skill will translate into all sorts of other fly fishing tactics. Uh, I hope that you've had fun. I hope that you have learned something here today. And uh, we'll see you next time.